at night. Good evening. The Magellan spacecraft has arrived at Venus. And obviously, that's what we're going to talk about this evening. But first of all, very briefly, uh, we have a comet. Not a bright one. It's called Levy's Comet. It's in the evening sky now, below the bright star Altair. And you can just about see it with the naked eye, and quite easily with binoculars. And this photograph, taken by Douglas Arnold, does show a bit of a tail. Well, I'm afraid it's not going to get bright, but it will be on view for the next week or so, and at least it's rather better than Austin's comet was. And now, on to our main subject. If you've got up early and looked out into the east before sunrise, you must have seen the brilliant planet Venus. Actually, Jupiter's there too, and on August the 12th, the two appeared side by side in the sky. Venus rather the higher and the brighter. And that was a photograph I took at that stage. Um, it um, shows a bit of a trail because that was an unguided camera. But there they are, and uh, a few nights ago, I made a drawing of Venus telescopically. Now, it doesn't show very much, but frankly, that's not my fault, because you can never see the actual surface of Venus. It's permanently hidden by the dense, cloudy atmosphere, and all you can see are very vague, streaky, impermanent features. So, before the space age, there was a great deal about Venus that we did not know. Of course, we did know how it moves. It's um, about 20 million miles closer to the sun than we are, Average distance, 67 million miles, as against our uh, 93 million. So it has a shorter year. It takes nearly 225 Earth days to go around the sun. But it has a very long day of its own, 243 Earth days. So in theory, the day on Venus is longer than the year, which is very strange. In size and mass, it's almost the equal of the Earth. But it's a very different kind of world. And um, even before the space age, we found out that the atmosphere is composed very largely of the heavy, unbreathable gas, carbon dioxide. And so presumably, Venus was very hot. But that was really all we knew. And we didn't know whether the surface was all land, or all sea, or a mixture of both. And in fact, the first really reliable information we had came way back in 1962, with the pass of this probe, Mariner 2 which flew by Venus and sent back some information showing, among other things, that the planet really is extremely hot. Surface temperature not far short of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So certainly you can't have any water there, and presumably no life either. Since then, there have been various probes. This is a picture taken by an American pioneer Venus, and all you can see there is the top part of the layer of cloud. So how can we actually map the surface if you can't see it? Now, there's only one way, and that is by using radar. And we'll say more about radar in a few moments. But we do have radar maps of Venus already, and here is one. But please don't be deceived. That blue color is not water. Venus, as I've said, is far too hot for any water to exist there. That is merely a contour map, and it does show the uplands and the plains. But we've even got pictures directly from the surface. Because the Russians have dropped unmanned probes down, landed them gently, and sent back, well, there's one picture from Venera 9, showing part of the spacecraft and the rocks. And here's an even better one from Venera 13, again showing part of the spacecraft. And uh, those rocks, uh, they look orange, actually they're grey, they're merely reflecting the light of the sky. But Venus is a most unfriendly kind of place. From Earth, we have got reasonable radar results by now mainly by using this instrument, the 1,000-foot dish at Arecibo in Puerto Rico. And that has sent back pictures such as this, showing Venus in reasonable detail. But obviously, for really close-range mapping, we did need another space probe. And that was the purpose of Magellan, launched in April 1989. Well, it spent some time getting to Venus, and it arrived there on August the 10th this year and it was put into a closed path around Venus, so it now makes one revolution in three hours, nine minutes, and it reaches a minimum distance of 250 kilometers above Venus's surface, and it has already started to send back results. And at this stage, um, I'm delighted to introduce once again my old friend, Dr. Peter Catamole, a NASA principal investigator, and of course, a well-known planetary geologist. 
Peter, first of all, what exactly was Magellan's main purpose? Well, because um, we can't actually see the surface of Venus with normal visual wavelengths, we have to use radar, and Magellan is principally a mapping probe. And aboard the craft, there are two antennae. One of the points vertically downwards, and it's because we know the speed of all electromagnetic radiation, it sends a beam straight down to the surface, and the scientists are simply able to measure how long it takes to get back and measure the height of the surface. So there is an altimetric mapper aboard the probe. Then there's a larger 12-foot antenna, which s takes pictures of the surface sideways by sending down a radar beam, letting it interact with the surface along a narrow strip, um, and then the beam comes back and is analysed by the spacecraft. Now, radar beams behave just like light beams. They cast shadows. So the mapping part of the high-gain antenna experiment will show whether there are hills or valleys. And hills and valleys show shadows. And so we'll get light and dark areas coming back on the images. Now, furthermore, the beam is modified by the surface. Rough surfaces give a bright return. Smooth surfaces, like a metal or water, would give a dark return. And superimposed on the, the scenery, we have to interpret these different kinds of return signature. So does the mapping part of the mission. And then thirdly, there are instruments aboard to measure the thermal properties of the atmosphere of Venus, which are quite complex. Magellan is a highly complex probe, and it has given problems. In fact, immediately after being put into its orbit around Venus, it went silent, and it was out of touch for several hours. Since then, there's been a further breakdown, also lasting for several hours, and we're not sure why it is. It may be that when the probe was put into its closed path, it had to throw off a casing, and it could be that part of that casing wasn't completely thrown off. I don't know. Anyhow, it does seem that there is some external cause there. But at the moment, communication has been re-established, and although it's not perfect, it is sending back very good pictures, so we've simply got to hope for the best. Peter, what exactly have we already found out about the surface of Venus? We found out quite a lot. The, the first batch of information came from the American pioneer Venus, and this produced the first radar map of the planet. And it is rather different from the Earth in many respects. For instance, about 65% of the surface is composed of sort of upland rolling plains, which are shown on this map as a sort of light blue colour. A smaller uh, area of the planet is composed of lowlands, unfortunately shown in this dark blue. They're not uh, full of water, as you said, but about 15 to 20 percent are lowlands. And then there are about 8 percent of highland regions, shown here on the map in green and yellow. Uh, so the distribution of topography is somewhat different from that of the Earth. We have no oceans on Venus. Now, when you look at the images that Venera sent back, and these are built up from radar strips, um, we can see that there are light and dark areas. Now, the lighter, brighter areas, what we call a radar bright signature, is an area of rough surface. And you can see on this image that there are lots of rough areas. And indeed, there's a, a crater with a dark floor, and these rough areas are crossed by faults. So we have geological features rather similar to those we have in certain parts of the Earth. Now, in addition to those images, we have images um, from Venera, we have images from Arecibo, and we've been able to look at some of the topography and geology in some detail. For instance, the northern continent, if I may use that term very loosely, is called Ishtar Terra. And within it is a huge plateau called Lakshmi Plain, I and mean, when you see it on this uh, strip image as a fairly smooth area, it's a plateau about twice the size of Tibet, and it's wrapped around at the edges by bright and dark belts which appear to be like fold mountain belts. They appear to be geological features caused by compression. And the obtaining of these early images really excited geologists who thought, well, perhaps we have what's called plate tectonics on Venus. So we have features rather like fold mountains on Earth. Now, if we were to uh, were able to, to move east of um, Lakshmi Plain and Ishtar Terra, we would come across geological features that are rather different. Now, in the center of that Venera image, you see a, a dark area, which is a volcanic caldera. It's called Cleopatra Terra. And to the east of it, you see something that looks like woodblock flooring. And this is a, a series of blocks and ridges and faults, which appear to be formed by compression, but they produce structures quite unlike anything that we have seen on the Earth. How do they look on a global scale? Well, if we looked at these kinds of features on a global scale, uh, and we can do this particularly with the beautiful Arecibo mosaics that we have, you can see at the top of that picture, Lashmi Planum and the fold mountain belts wrapped around it. You can see the rest of the rolling plains are traversed by these broad belts of linear features. And indeed, you can see areas of rough lava flows too. So there are 
what seem to be almost global sized features, rather like some of those that we have on the Earth. On the Earth, there are areas where the Earth's crust appears to be being stretched and literally torn apart, so the Earth's a very active world. Now, how does that compare with Venus? That's an interesting question. Well, certainly there are many areas on Venus which seem to have been stretched. For instance, the, if we go towards the equator and we look at the region known as Aphrodite Terra, shown here as the green and yellow area, you can see it's an elongated zone of upland about 21,000 kilometres long. And running across that upland area are a whole series of rifts. Uh, these are uh, valleys formed by the stretching of the crust. And one of them has a rather peculiar scorpion shape, as you can see. But if you look carefully, there's a series of rifts running along the length of Aphrodite, but also important lines of rifts that cross-cut the main feature. You can see one running northwest to southeast and one running north to south. And these clearly show that the equatorial regions of Venus are being, or have been, I should say, stretched apart at some time in the past. And when we think of these things in terms of what happens on the Earth, well, we do have features rather like this on the Earth. For instance, if we were to look at the floor of the Atlantic Ocean, we have an enormous mountain range called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge, which is cross-cut by a series of what are called transform faults, and they simply tra transpose the crest of the ridge a little bit either to the west or the east along its course. Now, some of the recent Arecibo images have interestingly shown that this same kind of thing seems to have happened in the western part of Aphrodite. So if we look again at just the, the western part of Aphrodite, you, you are able to see that the central ridge of Aphrodite, shown here as the thicker of the lines, is severed or cross-cut or offset by other fractures. Now, if we look at this on a block diagram, we see what really happens across these structures. You can see the central ridge and its central rift being offset by one of these uh, transform faults. And if you look very closely at a section of the offset, you'll notice a, a trough with clearly defined walls. Now, those step-like troughs are what we see in the floor of the Atlantic and indeed the Pacific, and this is exactly the kind of profile the Arecibo altimetry shows us to pertain across each of these transform faults in Aphrodite. So Venus clearly is an active world. And now, Peter, a very important question indeed. What about active volcanoes? Well, yes, if, the, if a planet is active tectonically, it means it's internally active, there ought to be volcanoes and volcanicity. And indeed, many of the images we have show there to be a plethora of volcanic structures. For instance, on, the, on this Venera image of the uh, rolling plains, uh, you see these circular dome-like features and associated radiating lava flows, which are very, very abundant in the rolling plains area. Then again, um, you see in other areas, particularly around Beta and Phoebe Regio, um, volcanic calderas. You see one in the centre of the picture with a dark wall and a bright centre from which radiate out long, lobate lava flows show up as a bright signature, which are anything up to about 400 to 500 kilometres long. They're very, very similar to the sort of things we see in Hawaii and the Galapagos. Then again, if we look more closely at Beta Phoebe Regio, which is an area Magellan is visiting, obviously in its program, uh, you can see two huge domes. And you see it on the left-hand side of this picture as bright uh, areas crossed by faults. Now, these are huge, two huge rises in the crust of Venus, which are aligned along rift faults, much the same way as we have in the East African rift on Earth. And crowning those domes are two huge volcanoes, Rhea, and theomons, which to all intents and purposes appear to have been recently active in geological terms. Now that picture on the right of a part of the East African Rift is about 50 kilometres across, and it will give you some idea of the kind of resolution that we should achieve if Magellan functions properly. That's what we will have for all of Venus. So this is a very exciting time. It is indeed. Well, just now you mentioned plate tectonics, the way in which the continents slide about over the Earth's interior. Do you think the same kind of thing happens on Venus? I would like to think that it does, simply because this is, it would make it the only other planet in the solar system, other than Io, which is active at the present time. Now, there is a problem with Venus. It doesn't seem to have any water today. Now, on the Earth, we have plenty of water, although we haven't seen too much of it this summer, but we have plenty of water. We have oceans full of water, and we have water inside the Earth. And these processes form layered rocks, sediments, which are what make up fold mountains. 
Now, we think we have fold mountains on Venus, yet it's very difficult to envisage how we can have sedimentary rocks, unless, of course, there was water on Venus' surface in the past. Now, if we look at a global map of Venus, you will see around the equator, around Aphrodite, we have extensional features. The crust is being pulled apart. It's the red arrows. Towards the poles, Venus is being compressed. There does seem to be a global pattern. Whether that's a present-day pattern or a pattern of the geological past, we hope Magellan will be able to give us the answer. But if you have plates sliding under each other, I mean, Venus is very hot. Wouldn't they just be melted? Well, I don't know that they'd melt, but we do have a problem. If the crust is hot, it's very buoyant, so it's pretty difficult to see how any one slab of Venus's crust could actually slide down underneath another one. It wouldn't be dense enough. So and this is one of the problems that we have. So certainly, Venus is a world that still has a great deal of mystery for us. And now, Peter, I think the time has come to look at some of those superb pictures sent back by Magellan over the last few days. Oh, this is, uh, this is a staggering picture. On the left of the screen, we have one of the very excellent uh, Arecibo pictures um, of a faulted region. You'll see at the bottom left a circular feature uh, in a small box. Now, that area seen on the Arecibo picture is what actually you see on one of the early Magellan pictures. You see the strip on the right of the screen shows it to be far, far more furrowed and complex than we would have expected from the Arecibo image. It's a smooth, flawed area with very, very furrowed walls, and you can see a whole series of faults towards the bottom. And this is a, a high-resolution hone-in on one of these, and you can see a very complex landscape of ridges and troughs. It's a little bit different to the sort of thing I experience on the Earth. Here again is a dark, flawed series of valleys, um, and, but they are crossed by brighter radar features, some kind of ridges, which is giving a, a complex, sort of tessellated terrain, which is rather unearth-like. Now, this is obviously a mosaic picture. It would be about 12 miles across, uh, and it shows a very clear-cut, uh, brightly lit feature, which must be a fault plane, which is cross-cutting a whole series of features. And here you see it blown up. Um, enlarged here, you see dark uh, volcanic plains, I would imagine, cut by faults of various persuasions running in different directions. This is a very high-resolution picture. Now, this looks to me like a bit of Mars I'm quite familiar with. At the bottom you see what looks to be like a, a volcanic caldera with radiating flows and fractures which are overlying much older fractured terrain at the top of the picture. We seem to have some age relationships shown here which we would never see from either Arecibo or Venera data. Oh, that's, uh, that really is superb. That looks like a part of the moon. It looks like the crater Tsiolkovsky, which is an enormous impact crater on the far side of the moon. Uh, what you have is a, an enormous lump of rock hitting the surface of a planet, excavating and actually melting the subcrust. So that dark floor would be a place to try and sample because it would give us some indication of the composition of the rocks which exist beneath the surface of the planet. And here, it gives us a, a nice impression of how much better the, the image on the right are the Magellan pictures than anything we've had hitherto. The resolution is, is superb. And this uh, is obviously the highest resolution picture that we have so far seen. It really does look like a lunar impact crater to me. So, Peter, are you happy with what you've got so far? Well, if it's all like this, we, we, we'll have work for years to come. Well, I think it's highly encouraging. And if all goes well, over the next Venus year, we should have a complete radar map of Venus. That, of course, is assuming that the problems with Magellan don't recur, and uh, let's only hope that they don't. So from Peter and myself, good night.